Open the eyes of my heart. Holy, holy, holy. Thanks, Pastor Sean, for giving me the chance to do this. Feel it? I feel it. Oh, come hear a story. Oh, come gather friends. I'll tell you a tale, though it isn't done yet. You saints and you sinners, you daughters and sons, the best is yet to come. was a valley that led to a storm. Both were a darkness as real as a war, leaving us broken with nowhere to run. But the best is yet to come. Sing that with me. Yeah, the best is yet to come. So lift up your glasses, raise them on high. Here's to the failure we're leaving behind. Cheers to the future, cause it's just begun. All oh, the best, yeah, the best, yeah, the best, the best is yet to come. Hey! Yeah, we'll drown out the voices inside of our heads, and we'll bury the critics as though they were dead, and we'll prove to the cynics who said it can't be done that the best is yet to come. Sing it with me, peeps. Yeah, the best is. Yeah. Yeah, so lift up your glasses, raise them on high. Here's to the failure we're leaving behind. Cheers to the future, because it's just begun. All oh, the best, yeah, the best, yeah, the best. The best is yet to come. As long as we're breathing, it isn't done yet. Let's toast to the battles we haven't yet won. Because the best is yet to come. Lift up your glasses, raise them on high. Here's to the failure we're leaving behind. Cheers to the future, because it's just begun. Oh, the best, yeah, the best, yeah, the best, the best is yet to come, hey, yeah, the best is yet to come, yeah, the best is yet to come, yeah, the best is yet to, <sighs> come. I be lonely, long for heaven and home. When Jesus is my portion and a constant friend, I know. His eye is on the sparrow. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he's watching me.
why should I be troubled when his tender word I hear? Yeah. Why rest on his goodness in my in my feet Oh, I sing because I'm happy and I sing because I'm free Oh, his eye is on the sparrow His eye is on the sparrow And I know His eye is on the sparrow, His eye is on the sparrow, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He's watching me. Yeah, He's watching me. Yeah, He's watching you, oh, He's watching me. Never come close, nothing can compare. You're our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere Your glory, God, is what I to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close, nothing can come you're our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free, and my shame is undone. To be over 
presence, bless experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Oh. and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord. your presence Lord. Good morning and welcome to the online worship experience here at Bloomfield Congregational Church, where no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are on life's journey, no matter where you are right now, you are welcome here. I'm Pastor Sean and it is so wonderful to have you here today. If you would like to get closer connected to us, just find us on our website of www firstchurchbloomfield.org. That's www.firstchurchbloomfield.org, and we would love to get to know you better. You're also invited and welcome to join us for Bring Your Own Communion immediately following the service on the Zoom link that you can find at that website or on our service chat function if you are following this service on our online live stream. 
Now let's take a moment and try to take a moment to lay aside the weights that are bearing upon us in this world today. The things that can make us seem like it's so heavy that we are even bending over from carrying that weight. Try to just lay that aside for a little bit of time as we have our time together of worship. So now let us join together in our responsive call to worship found on screen and found in your order of service that you can find on our website. There are special times in history when we need to act more boldly. These are such times. We are asked to do things that matter, but that are often uncomfortable. We must do them anyway. The call to do justice is more urgent than ever. Let us respond to the call to do justice, even if it is hard, even if it is uncomfortable. Now let us join together in singing our opening hymn, the words will be on screen. to confession isn't something that's meant to make you feel bad or guilty or small. It's an opportunity to be able to reflect with yourself and God to say, where are those things that have happened that have caused you to veer off the path of the way of walking closely with God? 
As a wise friend once told me, if we're feeling separated from God, it's not because God veered off. We have the opportunity to let go of the weights and the gunk and the chains and the things that drag us down and move forward in a way that feels lighter, that allows us to be bolder, walking more closely in the way of Jesus and with God. So now let us join together in our unison prayer of confession that can be found in your order of service. God of unimaginable love, you pour out your spirit for us. You offer us the best things in life and show us clearly how to attain them. You offer us true meaning and purpose. But we resist it. We fight it. We look to others and ourselves for life instead of looking to you. We create our own way instead of following the way of Jesus. We use our own corrupting power instead of the spirit that you offer us. As a result, we fall short of your dreams for us. Dreams that, if fulfilled, would make your kingdom a more present reality in our lives and our world today. We repent. Forgive us. We repent and wish to return to you. We wish to return to you and we offer ourselves to be transformed so that we can continue to grow with you. And in doing so, Help to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now through no particular power vested in me, but only through your relationship in God, know that God only requires a contrite and sincere heart and wish to repent and turn and return to God. Know that your sins are forgiven. Now please enjoy and feel free to sing along with our good friend, P.W. Gopal. Yeah. 
It's now time for the pastoral prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, we ask for your support. We pray for this community of faith and all communities of faith to be places where people are trying to follow you, to follow the way of Jesus, to be disciples of Jesus. We also ask for your support and help and intervention and help for people who are grieving. Whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it was recent or a long time and many years ago. We pray for the loss of life across the country, including the loss of over 190,000 of your children from the virus, not just from the virus, Many of those deaths being totally preventable if the leaders were actually following your way. We ask you to draw close to those who have lost jobs or relationships or who are struggling financially. Be with those who are frightened as they see the fabric of our society being torn apart in so many ways. We also ask you to be with those who are battling addiction, that you might give them one day's strength. Or those who are dealing with mental illness, depression, anxiety, loneliness, despair, many of whom are especially vulnerable when so many of the things are going on in this world today. As the injustices continue to build, help those who are struggling to know that they are valued, if for no other reason than we care for them, and that they are a child of yours. Help us to have the courage to follow your way. We ask you to walk with us and be by our sides in ways that we can feel to help embolden us and give us strength for the path of head. And God, as people continue to return to school, we pray for all those students, teachers, and everyone else involved in making the education system great and safe for everyone involved. Help give the leaders wisdom to make the right decisions for everyone involved, especially, as Jesus said, for the most vulnerable among us. And now, as Jesus said, together let us pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. First Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, and 9 through 13. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship, the man who has been doing this? I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral persons, not at all, meaning the immoral of this world or the greedy and robbers or idolaters, since you would then need to go out of the world. 
But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister, who is sexually immoral or greedy, or is even an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or robber. Do not even eat with such a one. For what I have, what have I to do with judging those outside? It is not those who are inside that you are to judge. God will judge those outside. May we have wisdom from these words. So we are in part three of our three-part series on judging. And in part one, that we called weaponizing hypocrisy, we covered the passage where Jesus was talking about some people had specks in their eyes and some people who had logs in their eyes. And we pointed out that Jesus was saying that there are more than one kind of hypocrisy, that there are multiple types of hypocrisy. And we used different examples for what would represent the speck versus what would represent the log. For example, the doctor who was overweight but who still had the courage, even though he knew he was being a little bit of a hypocrite, telling the patient that they needed to lose Wait, there is hypocrisy, but not a big deal there because he's trying to do something good. Or people who are trying to follow Jesus, people who are trying to be disciples in that high bar that Jesus sets, and trying and trying to do it and trying to be better and failing, and there's some hypocrisies in there. But the attempt to be more like Jesus is a noble one. But then there are other types of hypocrisy, like people doing things intentionally, saying one th thing and doing another with the intent to manipulate. And Jesus called these people wolves in sheep's clothing who go in pretending to be one thing but are actually something else, going in to hurt other people for their own personal gain. And so we noted some of these people had the specks in their eyes, but some, these Wolves in sheep's clothing have these logs in their eyes, but we also noted that sometimes what will happen is instead of the people with the specs helping the people with the logs, the people with the logs will say, hey, let me help you with that. The people with the logs who can't even see anything because it's blocking their eyes are saying, you know, you're a hypocrite, accusing the people with small, well-intended errors, calling them hypocrites, weaponizing the word hypocrisy until people were on their heels and unable to help the people with the logs because they're afraid of being called a hypocrite. And then last week in our sermon, Twisting Judgment, we talked about how sometimes people say, who are you to judge? Or even we ourselves will say, who am I to judge? Because people twist some of the messages of Jesus and the Bible to say, you're not supposed to judge anybody. When in fact, that's not what Jesus says at all. Jesus doesn't say, don't judge. Jesus wants us to use our minds and our eyes and our ears and our hearts and the eyes of our hearts to discern the difference between right and wrong. To discern the difference between the small hypocrisies when people are trying to do the right thing but just might make a mistake versus the wolves in sheep's clothing. And we're supposed to do right judgment as opposed to judgment by appearances. And we noted some of the desperately sad and evil hypocrisies and judgment by appearances that we see today. But we're not supposed to judge by people's appearances, but by right judgment. And we are supposed to call out the people who are doing those things. We're supposed to be calling out the people with the logs in their eyes. We're supposed to be calling out the injustices. We're supposed to be thinking about what is just and unjust and use our intellects and our spirits to know the difference between right and wrong. Because both Jesus and then the Old Testament prophets like Micah, as noted in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, where God says, what do I expect of you but to do justice. You can't know what the difference between doing justice and injustice is unless you're judging between the two things. You can't go and correct the injustices unless you are judging and assessing a situation to be unjust. 
And that is what we are called to do, to do justice. But to be humble about that and make sure we're keeping ourselves in check with whether we have a speck or logs in our eyes so that we're keeping ourselves humble and doing the work with mercy. So now we are in part three of the series, and this is called Course Correction. Because when we're doing this, we need to know who are we going to correct? Who are we called to correct? Who does the Bible, who does Jesus, who do the other major people in the Bible call us to correct, and how do they call us to do that? So we are going to go into part three, course correction. And we're going to start that by going into the scriptures, specifically the letter of Paul to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, starting with chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, It is actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not even found among the pagans. Now here he doesn't mean the Gentiles because they're in Corinth and the majority of the people who were there who have become Christians were Gentiles and converted to Christianity. And Corinth is a Roman city. Here the pagans refer to the Romans. And it is of a kind not even found among the pagans for a man is living with his father's wife. He's talking about incest here. But not incest with the son with his actual mother. This is with a stepmother. Now, Rome took adultery very, very seriously. In fact, if you were caught in adultery, one of the punishments could be that the two people involved could be sent away to separate islands in addition to financial penalties to compensate the person who was hurt by the affair. And this is even more significant than that, and certainly that would be considered serious today. And in verse 2 it says, and you are arrogant. Very quickly, Paul is switching from the conduct of the individual to the conduct of the community, which is Paul's primary area of focus. Should you not rather have mourned instead of ignore it? Should you not rather have mourned so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you? He's trying to point out that it is the community that is at stake here. And this is consistent with what Jesus had talked about. That if someone does something very significant in your community of faith, that first you go talk to them, then a couple people, and then the congregation addresses it. And what's important to understand is this is not the first time Paul is talking to this community of faith. Paul had visited them before he wrote this letter. In addition, even though this is called the first letter to the Corinthians, it's not the first letter that Paul had written to this community. In this letter, other letters are referred to. And so Paul had previously addressed these type of issues in different ways and now is coming down harder since they have not addressed them. He is talking to the community of faith about adhering to the standards that they had agreed to and understood as people of faith in their community. What happens when you don't follow those standards that you set for your community? Your community can fall apart. Let's take an example a little closer to home. Here in our community of faith of Bloomfield Congregational Church, we have a behavioral covenant where we have agreed in ways we are going to treat each other. And this is one of the most exceptional behavioral covenants I have seen in my entire time, and I've seen a lot of them. But what would happen if people began to break them, if people began to be mean and bully each other and do the types of things that we say not to do in our behavioral covenant, and we didn't do anything about it? Well, eventually, the fabric and the foundation of the community of faith that we have would break apart and our church would become a house of cards. That if we didn't enforce this, if we didn't do things to hold up our behavioral covenant and the standards that are necessary for a community of faith, it would be broken and this house of cards would collapse and the church would fall apart. 
And that would happen internally, but if people saw that and heard about it externally, it would also diminish the reputation of the community of faith and the church overall. It would reduce the reputation and diminish the reputation within the community. And Paul was concerned that if they didn't do this, it would cause the collapse of their community of faith as well as the reputation of the early Christian movement of what was going on. So let's return now to Paul's letter, starting back with verse 9, and see what we have. Verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter, that's referring to one of the previous letters I was talking about before, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral persons, now, here comes one of the big, big, big points in his letter. Not at all meaning the immoral of this world, since you would then need to go out of the world. What's he talking about there? Paul is saying, I'm not talking about the people who are not part of this Christian movement. I'm not talking about people who are outside of your community of faith and the larger Christian church. Because you need to be in the world. Jesus constantly said, I need you to go out into the world to spread the good news and be disciples and show what it means to love one another as I have loved you, to help the oppressed, to do the justice that needed to be done in the world. Paul's saying, I'm not telling you not to associate with people who are doing these things who aren't part of this community of faith. That's part of your job, to go to those people and spread the good news. He said in verse 11, but now I am writing to you not to associate with someone who bears the name brother or sister, someone who is part of the Christian community, the overall Christian movement, who is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater or reviler, meaning someone who viciously attacks other people verbally, a drunkard or robber. Do not associate with them. And he added to the list that he had talked about with the people from the world. The list was longer for the people who were part of the Christian faith. Not even to associate them. So I wonder, not just associating with them, I wonder when you hear this description, sexually immoral, greedy, worships things more than God in the Bible, insults people viciously constantly, is drunk whether it's on wine or on power, and steals from other people whether you can think of anybody today who fits that description. And not only are we not supposed to associate with them, there are some people who say that that individual is described in the Bible. Well, he is. Just here, not where they expected it. And Paul says, do not even eat with such a one. To which you might say, well, didn't Jesus sit down? with the sinners and tax collectors and the others. But Jesus was sitting down with the people Paul is saying it's okay for the people to go to as well. They were not yet part of the community either. Paul would still encourage the people of the community of faith to go to those people outside the community of faith and sit down and have dinner and eat with them, just like Jesus said. What he says here, for what have I to do with judging those outside? God is to judge those outside. Is it not those who are inside who you are to judge? Is it not those who are inside that you are to judge? Paul is saying it's not our responsibility to worry about the people who have not signed up for the commitment of following Jesus. That it is not up to us to judge people who are outside the Christian arena. That we are first and foremost supposed to hold ourselves, our community of faith, but ultimately the whole body of Christ, the whole Christian movement, accountable. Those are who we are supposed to first go after. Those who are not upholding what Jesus called us to do. The majority of Christianity is so far off the rails that they have reduced it to things it was never meant to be. Christianity 
is not supposed to be first and foremost fire insurance. Meaning it's not a get out of jail free card from hell. That's not what it's about. And signing up and saying Jesus is your Lord and Savior is not a first class ticket to heaven. That's not what it's about. It is about a commitment to follow for all of us together to be following Jesus. And that's a high bar as we were talking about before. That is a high bar to follow. Following Jesus is a high, high standard. But what happens sometimes, sometimes gradually, slowly, insidiously, sometimes in big ways so that people make things so bad, so loudly that we get disoriented. And by the time we turned around, the faith has been reduced and we, the new standard just seems normal. People in the Christian movement, people who call themselves Christians have been gradually lowering and lowering and lowering and lowering and lowering the bar for what it means to be Christian to the point where the faith is becoming a house of cards. And there's a risk that it will be broken and torn asunder onto the ground, worthless. So many people are turning away from the faith because they see the ugliness of what it has become and how different it is from what Jesus has said it's supposed to be, which is beautiful, defending the oppressed and all the people that so many people would say it's a beautiful faith if we did it the way Jesus asked us to do it in the way Paul talks about. And our country, with all its potential and all its wonderful components, with the Christian movement tying itself to the powers that be so tightly and distorting the faith so badly, is risking tearing the very fabric of our society apart. Taking something potentially wonderful and strong and amazing and turning us potentially into a house of cards that itself could fall apart. We need to take action now. We need to take action in the way that Paul was describing, the way that Jesus describes for those who call themselves Christians. Because what's happened is we haven't just gone a little askew the majority, not small parts, but two of the largest groups in the world who call themselves Christian don't just have it a little wrong, but completely opposite from what Jesus said for us to do in following Jesus. And what Paul said in terms of following Jesus and following the path of Christianity, Paul just said in 1 Corinthians, who am I to judge the ones on the outside? Are we not to judge the brothers and sisters of the Christian faith first? Yet large groups within Christianity are out there saying, you're bad. You people are bad. You immigrants, outsiders. You Muslims, outsiders. You poor. Anybody who is not in with their group which is the exact opposite of what Paul said. And yet another enormous denomination. Paul says, first, we're supposed to be taking care and judging our own selves and our own Christian faith and not people outside of our faith. Who am I to judge? Only God judges that. We do not judge that. But huge denomination says, be one of us or you burn an eternal hellfire. That is the opposite of what Paul says, the opposite of what the Bible says, the opposite of Jesus' message of love and justice. We need to act. The time is now. And where we need to focus our energies to point out where the logs are in people's eyes that are so big they can't see to change where the hypocrisy is so great, where the wolves in sheep's clothing are, are in the groups of people who call themselves Christians, and that is precisely who we are called by Paul to address, to call them out and say, this isn't right, that what is being done is un 
just because we are to do justice, and part of that is to call out our own. And yes, we need to be mindful of what we have logs in our own eyes. But we need to be bold or we have a chance that Christianity is going to collapse entirely into something that bears no resemblance to what Jesus wants and the beauty of what can happen in this world if we truly follow him. And the powers that be are all embedded in it. And you might say, what can I do? It's so big, there's so many. What can I do and what can we do is this community of faith. I get it, it's hard and the task seems so enormous, but this is what gives me hope and I hope it gives you hope as well. That's what the movement started with. There was only a small group of disciples to start with. And they were facing large religious powers, large political powers who were in cahoots trying to keep the status quo the way it was, distorting their faith, distorting things against justice. And this small group of people who were supposed to be destroyed by those powers, intimidated by them, went and gradually, piece by piece, built a movement. And no, it didn't happen in a couple years. It didn't happen in a lifetime. But it happened, and it can happen again if we are committed to following Jesus and doing justice. We need to be bold in this moment because this moment matters. The faith is at a desperately dangerous time. Our society is at a desperately dangerous time, and we need you Jesus needs you. God needs you and all of us to call out the injustices of this world, particularly the ones within our own faith. To do justice humbly. That's what we're to call to do now boldly. So let's do it. Amen. Giving is not an obligation. It's an opportunity to be part of something that makes the world better. Something where we think beyond ourselves to help make God's dreams for this world a reality. To make it the kind of place we all dream that it can be. Now please enjoy the music as we have our time of offering.
God of abundance, thank you for all of the gifts and the blessings in our lives, for each of the blessings that the people who are watching this service and experiencing this service have had the benefit to enjoy this week, this month, this year, and in their lifetimes. Thank you for those who are willing to take chances, to help the world correct its course, to make the world better for others. Thank you for your abundant and steadfast and overflowing grace and compassion and love. Thank you for the amazing Black Lives Matter mural that was unveiled this week here in Bloomfield. And for this community of faith for supporting its creation. Thank you. We are also grateful for the gifts that have been given here by the people in this service and beyond. Gifts of time, talent, and treasure. May they be taken by the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit do what it does, which is to take those things and multiply them in the world to make this world a little bit more like heaven, as you would have it be. Now let us join together in singing our closing hymn, The Words Will Be On Screen. Thank you for joining us today. You're now invited to join us for Bring Your Own Communion, followed by our time of just gathering community and your opportunity to ask any questions that you might have as well. But before that, the benediction. May love bless you and keep you. May love make its face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and be gracious unto you 
May love lift up its countenance, its countenance upon you, and give you peace, and give you Go in peace. This is not an age of faith. This is not an age of miracles. We don't believe anything they say. We don't believe anything at all. But when the December comes and grabs you by the throat, Better look for something burning deep inside your core. From the top of this mountain, I can see King the blue of the vineyard, and the gold of the grain right across that river. Candles flicker. If I didn't know better, I'd crawl in the trees. Well, the walls of Jericho and the walls of Jerusalem came tumbling down long ago, and they never got built again. Will you stand in the rubble where the rocks and bullets whine? Will you stand in the garden, reach your hand across the line? From the top of this mountain, I can see Canaan, the blue of the vineyard. can see Canaan, the blue of the vineyard, and the gold of the grain. Cross that river, candles to grand. If I didn't know better, I'd call it a dream. From the top of this mountain, I can see Canaan, the blue of the vineyard, and the gold of the grain. If I didn't know better, I'd call to the